I believe that every human deserves quality sleep and I'm on a mission to make science-backed sleep information easy to understand and more accessible to all. This is what my guest today believes. In today's episode, we answer three questions. When might someone be a good candidate for CBTI? How effective is CBTI? What's the best way to find a CBTI provider? Dr. Sarah Silverman is a Stanford-trained holistic sleep specialist and wellness consultant. She's a clinical health psychologist with fellowship training in behavioral sleep medicine. She's one of the few sleep specialists in the U.S. that trained at the Stanford Sleep Medicine Center and learned from some of the world's best sleep experts. For over a decade, she has specialized in CBTI, helping individuals with chronic insomnia learn to sleep soundly without medication. Let's get started. Hey everyone, I'm Deepa, Light Functional Medicine Practitioner, author and new Gini and you're listening to the Sleep Whisperer podcast, the only sleep podcast with conversations and meditations. I'm on a mission to share profoundly insightful sleep conversations with global visionaries that merge together functional medicine and ancient wisdom. Breathe in bliss through weekly guided meditations and let yourself enter the land of dreams. Together, let's unravel the pieces, get to the roots and understand the right tools to transform your sleep completely. Through this podcast, I want you to dream the best version of yourself. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey. Sarah, welcome to the Sleep Whisperer podcast. It's a pleasure to be hosting you today and um, I think it's well worth the wait. As I said, I find the way you put information out very inviting, very accessible. There's knowledge, but in a way where there's humility. And I think I just feel drawn to your message. And that's how I reached out to you through our mutual friend and uh, very dear friend of mine, Dr. Arti Surya. So big shout out to her just for getting us in touch. And today we are talking about um is cbti for you and i've done one episode on cbti overall a long time ago maybe two years ago but i would like us to be uh, your i mean focusing on these specific areas for example how do you know if it is for you um so maybe if we could just get a very quick intro into sarah like what uh brought you into the specific area of using CBTI for navigating sleep and how did you discover that area and uh, just a little bit of peek into Sarah's life before we get into CBTI itself. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me and for that lovely introduction. I I so appreciate uh, your your um, willingness to have me on your podcast and for me to share about one of my favorite subjects, which is sleep. And yes, I, I guess you could say I started in the sleep medicine world because of my own personal sleep struggles. It's something that dates back to early childhood for me. I often struggled with falling asleep. And that definitely followed into young adulthood and, of course, into my working years as well. Um, and it was always a challenge. So, of course, the irony, I decided to pursue uh, becoming a behavioral sleep medicine specialist to help other folks navigate some of the challenges associated with having problems falling asleep um, and staying asleep, too. Of course, sleep issues look a little bit different for everyone. But what I've learned over the years is, you know, something that's very dear to me is that everyone has their own unique chronotype or unique circadian rhythm. And that isn't something that is widely talked about. Uh, I think we live in a world that caters very much to the early bird and the, the, the true morning person. 
And so for those of us, myself included, who identify as maybe more of a night owl or an evening person, sometimes it can be really challenging to have to wake up for um, early appointments or to work a typical day job or one that society deems as typical. So that is kind of my story in a nutshell, really stemmed from trying to understand what was going on with my own circadian rhythm and my own health. And that, of course, I think allows me to have a really deep understanding and, and helps my patients as well, knowing that, you know, I've, I've been there too, and I've been able to overcome what I was struggling with, with some of the very techniques that I now, of course, share with my patients. Absolutely. I think we all come down this road with our own journeys, and I think that's what makes us so... Um so much more in depth at understanding when somebody comes to us. But before we go into specifically CBTIs for us, could you just, I mean, we know that it's cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, but could you describe what CBTI in a nutshell is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so CBTI is considered the first line treatment approach for chronic insomnia in adults. And I would say fairly recently did it become the first line recommendation. So 2016, not too long ago. Um, and it is, you know, it is recommended as the first step for someone who maybe is struggling with either falling asleep, staying asleep, or maybe a combination of the two. And in a nutshell, as the name suggests, there is a cognitive piece and a behavioral piece to addressing sleep issues from more of a non-medication approach. So the cognitive piece focuses on any negative thoughts or beliefs around sleep, very much you know, how someone might be thinking about sleep and their relationship with sleep, and also a lot to do with confidence in their own natural sleep ability. And then the behavior piece is really addressing any behaviors or habits around sleep that someone might be doing that may be inadvertently perpetuating the sleep problem. So it's addressing both the thoughts and beliefs, the behaviors and habits, both the cognitive and behavioral piece to really help improve sleep and also help people get to a point where if it is a goal to come off of sleeping pills, whether prescription or over the counter. I think that's the very first time, Sarah, where you it's really made sense to me. So I've asked this question outside the podcast as well, and I've never got such a good explanation for it. And that dividing that into those two words makes so much sense that I think that's something that I'm going to carry away from this podcast for a long time because the very first time it made sense to me. So let's jump into looking at when when would it be when would we know if it's for us are there specific uh, situations or people where it's more suited where it's not uh, how would I know personally if I might be a good candidate for CBTI mm -hmm. fantastic question and I love this because sleep disturbance or sleep disruption can look so different for everyone. And so I think one of the best ways to really tell whether or not you may be dealing with an insomnia problem, which insomnia we now know is considered its own primary sleep disorder, is what is called the 30-33 rule. So meaning if it takes you longer than 30 minutes to fall asleep and or you are awake during the night for more than 30 minutes, and that's happening more than three nights every week, then it may be a sign that you are dealing with a chronic insomnia problem. And that's kind of a quick screener to help determine whether you may be a good candidate for CBTI. Um, that's something that you can certainly do on your own. What I would also say is that sometimes it can help to also seek out a sleep specialist to help tease apart what you may be experiencing and you know, get a very thorough clinical evaluation done from a sleep perspective. And that can also lead to a referral for CBTI.
And you know, Sarah, you just mentioned 30, 33. Am I right about that? So 30 minutes to fall asleep, awake 30 minutes somewhere, and for three nights or more, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a, let me ask you this. So is there, for example, I could be going through a stressful situation in the last month, and maybe I'm going through this, what you just described, but... Is there a duration where it has to be going on, perpetuating for perhaps a certain amount of time before um, the, I mean, it could be 30, 33 for just a month in a stressful time. It could be longer. Mm -hmm. May I just clarify that? Yes, thank you for that. And to answer your question, there is a set time frame. So experiencing the 3033 for three months or longer. That is typically the cutoff point for chronic insomnia. But you're absolutely right. And especially for a lot of us, we may experience quite a bit of sleep disruption during a more stressful time. And you could have some of those changes take place for a week, maybe for a month, maybe less than that. And that would be more so under the umbrella of what's considered short-term or adjustment insomnia. And while CBTI is recommended for chronic insomnia, I have worked with a number of folks over the years who don't necessarily meet the criteria for chronic insomnia, but they have a bit of this adjustment insomnia, or maybe it happens on occasion, you know, during very stressful times, or sometimes even the night before a big event or the night before a flight. So what I have found is CBTI can still be very effective even for more of the short forms of insomnia, um, but also of course, very effective for chronic insomnia as well. And Sarah, now let's say that I decide that I've been going through this for a while and I want to take a look at CBTI. Uh, how effective is CBTI? And also, um, what is involved? So how long is it? Is Does it involve working one-on-one -on -one with a sleep specialist? So where, we'll, we'll come to where do I go for that a little later, but just how effective is it and what does it involve? Mm -hmm. So as far as the effectiveness of CBTI, what we know from the data, well, the data shows that about 70 to 80 percent of individuals who complete a full course of CBTI, which of course everyone's a little bit different, but on average, usually about four to six visits in total is what I would consider to be kind of a full course or program. 70 to 80 percent of folks will experience a significant reduction or total remission of insomnia symptoms. So very effective for the majority of folks. Of course, there's still a small percentage of people where maybe they don't see as much improvement. And I have experienced that over the years. And sometimes what I find is maybe there's another sleep disorder in the picture, like sleep apnea, for example, that maybe is not being treated or restless legs is also very common and that can make things worse. Maybe pain is in the picture. So there's often something else going on that maybe makes it a little bit more challenging to see the success. But I do find that most people will learn a ton from being in the treatment because a lot of it does involve education around the science behind sleep. So there's always something to take away from engaging in CBTI. But for the most part, I'd say majority of folks will benefit. And I must ask you this, Sarah, because you said that there might be somebody who's struggling with pain. Um, let me ask you, this is a bit of a tricky question, and I must ask you because you have such a sensitive approach to this subject that what I've heard in the past from those who have been sharing the message of CBTI is, uh, and I've seen this even within groups where you know, CBTI is considered, uh, it's almost as if the impression I got was ignore the external aspects such as pain, whereas you are bringing a different perspective to it. So what I'm asking is, could you clarify that? Because this is a very sensitive approach. You shared one that I'm really resonating with and one that 
I think is going to make me shift my perspective on CBTI quite a bit, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, so when you did say that there could be other factors going on, what is the approach that you take in those aspects? Fantastic question. And, you know, I think it is a tricky question uh, because it's so unique to each individual. But generally, I like to meet the person where they're at. And so, you know, I think it helps or it is helpful to target sleep and work towards improving sleep because there are quite a bit of things that we can do, which can be helpful in terms of, say, alleviating some of the pain or perception of pain. But for me and in my clinical experience and over the years, it is very hard to ignore when there are other things in the picture because they can make it a little bit more challenging to even implement the CBTI techniques. So I often see a number of different medical issues, lots of chronic medical conditions. I also see a lot of chronic mental health conditions, so anxiety and depression. And what I find is, you know, a lot of people need support, not only from the sleep side, but also from the nervous system regulation perspective. You know, I think everything is connected, mind, body, and spirit. And so, you know, it's taking the approach, the typical kind of protocol of CBTI, but also doing what I like to call CBTI augmented. So really incorporating some other techniques that are more integrative to help address some of these other medical conditions or mental health conditions that may also be impacting someone's overall sleep quality. So I, I personally like to address the person more from a systems perspective, more of a holistic perspective, as I know you do as well and um, can relate. So I think that definitely helps and speaks to maybe having more success with CBTI when we don't ignore these other factors that may be in the picture. I'm just I'm just having a big smile within Sarah because I really think that I mean this goes for even what I talk about with clients who are struggling with sleep is that I don't feel that we should ever be saying that there's just one thing that will I think looking at the whole picture looking at the whole person supporting them in whatever way can help them is what matters and what's the best way to find a CBTI provider yeah so you may already know this but there are not enough of us to go around there aren't a lot of us worldwide um, you know, the last time I checked as far as the number of insomnia specialists or behavioral sleep medicine specialists available was less than 800 in the world. So it can be really hard to find us. And sometimes it, it can make it difficult um, as a you know barrier to even getting started. Sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to find someone that's near you. The best place to my knowledge is the Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine. So it's behavioralsleep.org. They have an international directory that you can actually go and search your location and there'll be a list of providers who can competently deliver CBTI near you. Um, so that's one of the best places. And I will also say another very similar directory is the University of Pennsylvania CBTI directory. So it does involve um, a lot of folks who are also part of the Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine, but just as another place to potentially use as a resource for finding someone local. And Sarah, where where can somebody go if they want to work with you? And what what is the way? I mean, do you see people all over the world or only in a specific location? Yeah, so for traditional CBTI, I do see folks one-on-one -on -one through my practice and more of the traditional side of things. I can only see folks in the states in which I'm licensed. So that is very much capped for the United States. 
But I do also have a second business. It's a consulting practice, a consulting and, and coaching company where I do provide some CBTI coaching and that is available worldwide. So as another resource, you know, reaching out via social media, if you do find someone that, you know, specializes in insomnia and CBTI, social media is also a really great place to reach out to folks as well. Um, so I do a little bit of both, more of the traditional one-on-one -on -one CBTI in my private practice. And then I also do more consulting work um, that is available worldwide. Any final CBTI words, Sarah, to share today? Yeah, so CBTI can be a very effective way to help manage insomnia, and it's also a really great way to help get off of sleeping pills, if that is a goal. Um, what I will also say is if there is anyone listening that has been struggling with sleep for a very long time, know that there is hope, there is help available. And CBTI has been shown to be one of those very effective approaches to help overcome sleep issues. And I think at the end of the day, it's also finding someone that you feel can best support you. Um, because there are, you know, I, I would say, it's one thing to find a doctor or specialist, but I think it also helps when you have someone who you really trust and you know that can guide you along the way and support you. I think that's also very important as well. I think you, what you described, Sarah, was what we say in Eastern ancient wisdom is that when the student is ready, the master arrives. It's that there's a fit, there's that. a right fit for uh, mm -hmm. the healing path that, you know, you come across the right person who holds your hand and something like the hero's journey, which we all know about very well as well. Uh, but thank you for giving your time today. Where can people follow you on social media? And of course, they can scroll the show notes and get all the links, but please feel free to share where you'd like people to go as a first point of connection. Yeah, thank you so much again for having me. And I am at Dr. Sarah Sleep on most social platforms. I'm the most active on Instagram and LinkedIn, but I'm out there so you can find me on your favorite platform again at Dr. Sarah Sleep. And my website for more info about my practice and consulting work is drsarahsleep.com. Thank you, Sarah, for giving us your time today and the very sensitive approach. And as I said, let me just end the show by saying that I take back my thoughts on CBTI because I felt it was rigid. Uh, the impression I got from a lot of other practitioners was that it's rigid. It doesn't look at integrative health. Uh, and I'm always happy to say when I've made a mistake, I feel that we must accept when I take back my words for sure. And you've changed my mind. So I'm very grateful for that. And uh, mm. it was great having this conversation with you. Yes, it was great to be here. And I'm so glad to hear that I changed your mind. Um, that is great news. Thank you so much again. I've never believed in any rigid approach, no matter how research-backed they might be. I believe every person has a story and subtle nuances, and what might work for one might not work for another. It is this integrative approach that I have gone into in great detail in my own book, How to Sleep Better, The Miraculous 10-Step Protocol to Recharge Your Mind and Body. I go into how you can rebalance the whole body using Ayurveda and function medicine. I also have guided practices to restore balance within my healing digestion course, which you can get at www.ohahealth.com. Have a great day. This podcast is intended to provide helpful and informative material on the subject matter covered in the episodes. The podcast is not acting in the capacity of a doctor or a registered dietitian and is not rendering any professional healthcare or medical service. 
The information in the podcast is not intended as a substitute for medical advice or services or as treatment or cure for any particular health condition. The advice and tools contained herein may not be suitable for your situation. Any medical questions regarding contraindications and cautions or any questions of whether or not to proceed with any practices provided in the show should be referred to qualified health professionals before adopting the same the podcast specifically disclaims any responsibility for any liability loss risk personal or otherwise which may be incurred as a direct or indirect consequence of the use of information from this podcast or the application adoption of any of the information provided